Welcome to the CEC Report. It's the 8th of August. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm with CEC Leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. In this week's CEC Report, next banking crisis looming out of Europe. Ring fencing is a fraud. Only Glass-Steagall will save us. And Anglo-Americans lie to push Russia to war. So first, next banking crisis looming out of Europe. Ring fencing is a fraud. Only Glass-Steagall will save us. And Craig, you have to say that we've um, got evidence that um, we're getting real traction on our Glass-Steagall campaign in Australia because we have been a lone voice for how many years now? Three, four years demanding the separation of banking. And so this week, um, the Financial Re Review uh, reported that none other than David Murray, the chairman of the Financial System Inquiry, came out saying that we need to look at separating retail banking from investment banking. And then that was echoed the next day by the former governor of the Bank of England, Mervyn King, who's visiting Australia at the moment. And um, I think they said on the, on, the, uh, on the side of the Diggers and Dealers Conference in Kalgoorlie, mm -hmm. um, just before he went down Hay Street, or wherever it is, um, he, Mervyn King recommended the same thing. However, it'll be a rush, of, a rush of enthusiasm here, Robbie. Some people think, oh, look, they're, they're going to adopt CEC's policy of Glass yep. Deagle. However, it's a complete fraud. Yep. Now, if people have got our copy of Glass Deagle now, which we've published and put copies on the web, people can download it as a PDF or get a hard copy by calling us. Uh, the, the point is that you'll see there's a whole discussion in there about by the House of Lords in the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom. Uh, denouncing ring fencing because what it actually means is that, well, let's just look at Glass-Steagall first. Glass-Steagall means the complete separation of a bank. You take the National Australia Bank or one of our big four. Well, and one, one bank becomes two banks. That's right. And they have nothing to do with each other. Well, two banks or three, three whatever entities is, yeah, with yeah. insurance companies and, or whatever. But, but they're, they're separate. They're no longer tied in any way. There's no, in other words, the board of directors at the top is split, or there's yeah. two separate board of directors. What they're proposing on a ring fancy is that you keep the same board of directors at the top, but you have two so-called legally separated legally separate. entities. Mm. Now, if that was to work, why would you have Douglas Flint, the chairman of HSBC, Britain's largest bank, well, writing... One of the largest banks in the world, actually. ...is now writing and asking the government not to force banks to comply with new rules requiring them to ring fence their commercial businesses from their ca casino investment banking arms. Now, why is he saying that? It's because they're already doing... They're already trying yeah. to get around this new legislation because yeah. there's a real financial incentive to this. As was predicted in the House of Lords. Now, Craig, we'll come back to that because we want to go through some <coughs> of that in some detail. But before we do... We've got a live example in front of us right now of how this whole thing is an absolute fraud, right? And that's this crisis that's erupted in Europe in the banking system there coming out of Portugal. So I know this was mentioned last week on the program as well, but what's just happened is Port the Portuguese bank, Banco Espirito Santo, has just had a 4.9 billion euro bailout. The, the government and the central bank had to put up $4.9 billion to stop this bank from totally collapsing. Um, now, they combined the bailout with a bail-in, which in generic terms is, a, is where the creditors of this bank were also made to wear the losses. Mm. Now, when we talk about bail-in, Craig, we emphasise the depositor part of it because that's the most unjust idea of a bail-in, making depositors wear losses. But depositors are one category of creditors, right? And there's a broader cat. There's you know the whole in the whole category of everything that includes creditors. A lot of them have worn losses in the case of Banco Espirito Santo. Now, it just so happened that its biggest creditor was well, not so much creditor, biggest investor was the, a giant bank called Credit Agricole, which is a French bank. And Credit Agricole owned 15% of Banco Espirito Santo. Well, as of this week, they have just written that ownership off entirely. They've written down that 15% to nothing. Um, they've also suffered a 98% collapse in its quarterly earnings. This is the French bank, Credit Agricole, compared to the same quarter last year, right, because of its exposure to this bank. Now, that's, that's one bank's um, on flow, the, the flow and effect of one bank that we know of. We don't know the full losses of other banks exposed to... Um, Banco Espirito Santo across Europe. 
Th this, Robbie, this is in a country where the combined public and private debt is 360% of their GDP. Yes. I mean, this, this, this is happening in a country, and it's not just, it's not alone. Uh, there's hu there's not, this is an indicative of the bankruptcy of the transatlantic system. Now, what I find really fascinating is that they couldn't go completely to stealing actual deposits because of the Cyprus model has been so denounced yep. globally now, they couldn't go to that extreme. And there's a number of these leading bankers that are not very happy about the fact that they couldn't get their hands on the depositors. Now, you know, what they did do is they, they did follow the exact sim or similar model to C the Cyprus banking system. They created a new bank. They shifted the valuable assets the out, of, stuff the went into the new out of BES into the new bank called Novo uh, Banco. Called Novo Banco. Which means new, new bank. New bank. Very, very uh, right. original name, yeah. And they, they actually didn't actually bail in the depositors this time. But we're talking about that is in the terms of the, the, yeah, the directly directly. But you're talking about a bank in a system which is completely bankrupt, and it's only a matter of time before that next stage is properly. Well, we, well, we say we say directly, Craig, because they actually did end up bailing in depositors in a certain way, and I want to explain that. But first, the thing about this particular bank, Banco Espirito Santo. I mean, the GFC, the, what we call the GFC, the 2008 meltdown, that was coming up to six years ago now, right? It's five and a half years ago more, more cl closer to six years ago. Well, we're in August. It's September, yeah. six, six, six years ago. Um, uh, in that time, a lot of changes have been made. This bank complied with the European Union capital rules. It complied, under, it, it existed under the bail-in regime that's now in law in Europe. And it even assured authorities that it was ring fenced. In other words, its depositors and retail customers were pre separate, legally separated from the other parts of the bank. Well, that did not stop the Banco Espirito Santo management. When they got into a bind and got really desperate, what did they do? They sucked in their retail customers into making investments that shored up their own position. The way they did it was they had issued bonds which is appealing for loans, basically, from the bond market. But the bond market knew how bad the bank was. And in order to get someone to buy these bonds, they had to discount them really heavily. So then the management said, well, we've got a better idea. They took the bonds and they repackaged them and they sold them to their retail customers. In other words, they had bank investment salesmen calling up depositors and saying, we've got a good investment for you. They sold them, not at the discount rate that they'd tried to put them onto the, the bond market, they sold them at higher than face value, and they're sweet talking their customers into these, right? And they turned these customers from being just depositors into creditors mm -hmm. by doing that. Mm -hmm. And so now they've made, now that they've had this bail in where they've taken the good assets and moved them into the new bank, who's left holding the bad assets in the old bank? The shareholders, which is normal, and these what they call junior creditors, which are these poor mug um, retail customers that got talked into buying these, mm. these crappy bonds, right? So that is an example. They were able to do that under ring fencing. That, showed, that proves there that um, the, the arguments about ring fencing are just rubbish. And it shows that in, a real, in, a, in practice, the depositors have been made to uh, wear losses, but they had to use fraud to do it. Mm. Um, and then here's the bottom line. They still had to have a bailout. Yeah, well. Now the big argument for bail-in is, if we have bail-ins, you won't need bailouts. Taxpayers won't have to put up any money. We'll have bail-ins. Well, they've had a bail-in, and they've still had to have 4.9 billion euro dollar bailout. And like I said, this proves the arguments of the House of Lords. So we'll take a break. When we come back, we're going to go through. We'll just quote you what these House of Lords guys said last year that has been proved in spades in this case. Welcome back to the CEC report. Just before the break, we were using the case of this collapse of this Portuguese bank, Banco Espirito Santo, to be a live example of the difference between ring fencing, which is what the head of the Australian Financial System Inquiry is proposing for Australia, bank ring fencing or illegal separation, and what we're proposing, which is Glass-Steagall, a full separation. So Craig, let's talk about, let's, let's quote what some of these British 
House of Lords members who, incidentally, were ex are experts themselves because a whole bunch of them are themselves bankers from the City of London. And so last November, 26 and 27, they had a big debate on this and they said some pretty devastating stuff about how ring fencing is inadequate and you need fast eagles. Yeah, I think, Robbie, I think when we're talking about this program, if anyone's been dealing with the Commonwealth Bank, I think they can, they can really appreciate the actual nature of bankers as opposed to all the advertised hype. But this Lord Forthside of Drumlean, um, he basically was a, as you say, he was a banker for seven, seven years, an investment banker. So he knew what investment banking was like. And he said that bankers are extremely adept at getting between the wallpaper and the wall. <laughs> if, if they can find a way to get around something, they, they will. will. And then you had Lord uh, Lawson, you know, I think Nigella Lawson's father. Right, who's it, Lord? Yeah, and the, the modern people might think that's his claim to fame. His real claim to fame, Craig, is he was the ch ch Chancellor of the Exchequer during the 1980s under Margaret Thatcher. So he, he made the point that, the, and this is what I've re referred to in the, uh, in, in the show before, he said that the culture of retail banking and the culture of investment banking are two quite separate things. One is, or should be, a culture of caution and prudence. The other is a culture of risk-taking of, of a totally different order. And this is another thing that the Vickers Commission did not look at. So here you have this Vickers ring-fencing proposal, but they're not looking at the actual nature of banking. What they're combining here. Commercial banking, regular banking, mortgages, lending. It should be very prudent, very strict, and very regulated. And the other side of the banking, the investment merchant banking, well, it's made up of yahoos. It's made up of rab uh, people are prepared to take the risks and lose people's money. Now, there might be higher returns for gambling like that, but you don't imperil the major backbone of your economy. That is a commercial banking system yep. by allowing these people to run uh, the commercial banking system. And that's what's happened in the deregulation and the takedown of Glass-Steagall is that you've got this casino mentality in bankers running the banking system. And Lord totally. Lawson also made the point you made about two subsidiaries but under one board of directors so it's that's a bit of a joke. It's never been done before. And one of the, the the another one of the, the um, contributors to the debate, Craig, was Conservative Lord Hamilton of Epson, who he said, this is what he said at the time, he said, I do know that many people in the city today are, as we speak, working on ways to get around the ring fence and to make sure that money held in clearing banks can be used in investment banks. Because it's extremely profitable. That's right. This is where they've made their money. This is why you're seeing these record profits. It's because it all's coming from the profits and uh, yeah, fictitious profits, in a sense, from the, uh, from, the, uh, prop from the property bubbles, from the share trading casino, from the derivatives trading benches and so forth. Well, let's have a look at this graph, because this, oh, this is brilliant, this graph. And this shows you uh, the, in blue, the blue, the blue marks there, they are banking crises in America where banks have collapsed. And you'll see, Craig, a very big gap between 1930, just after 1932 and 1980. Now, that gap, of course, is the era of Glass-Steagall. Glass-Steagall wasn't repealed fully until 1999, but they began watering it down in the early 1980s. And as soon as they started watering it down, actually, you had a first, you had the 1980s banking crisis, which was a savings and loan crisis. But it, and it was Alan Greenspan who led the watering down of Glass Steagall. But um, this is a pretty conclusive evidence of the power of a full separation of banking to protect the most important people, which is the customers. Mm. And I think, look, what can you say? I mean, the, the fact is, you had the Glass Steagall came in. It did what has to be done now. It separated out these huge banks and made it illegal for a commercial bank in involved in taking deposits to be involved in stockbroking, yep. to be involved in investment and merchant banking. It gave them a year to break themselves apart and literally uh, create two separate institutions or more institutions so that you didn't have the sorts of risks associated with, uh, with uh, investment and merchant banking uh, in the commercial banking system. And the proof is that it worked. Yep. All right, well, very good. We're going to stop now. When we come back, we're going to talk about what's happening in Russia and Ukraine. Welcome back to the CEC Report. Finally, Anglo-Americans lie to push Russia to war. Now, Craig, um, the big announcement from Australia's standpoint this week is we're, we're all upset because Russia has announced sanctions against us 
um, and Tanya Plibersek is claiming that they're, what have we done? Well, we'll go through that. Um, it comes as that you've had more uh, fear on the markets, for example, and just in general, that because this line got around that Russia is about to invade Ukraine, right? And the first person to say it was the Polish Prime Minister um, on Wednesday, and it caused the stock market crash right around the world when he said Russia is about to start to, to invade Ukraine. It was started, the week started with David Cameron, though, the, the British Prime Minister, because David Cameron virtually declared war on Russia because he said Russia is definitely to blame for the NH17 disaster, even though there's been the, no concluded um, investigation yet. Um, and then he demanded to his fellow EU member countries, do, don't repeat the mistakes of World War II. And what does that mean? Oh, we appeased Hitler, so we can't appease these guys. We've got to, we've got to go in there. And what they're calling for is stationing NATO in the Baltic states, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania. The Germans are resisting this, and they want to stick to the 1992 Budapest Treaty with Russia. And that treaty agreed that NATO forces would not be positioned in former Warsaw Pact countries. And it's the Brits that are pushing hard to shred that treaty. They say, oh, that doesn't ap ap apply anymore. And the Brits are hosting the NATO Leaders Summit on the 4th of September in Wales, where obviously they're going to push really hard for that. So what we want to do, we're going to show from the US State Department's own words how blatant their lies are. And the first thing we want to see, this, is, this clip will show the US State Department spokesperson Jen Psaki, who people will be recognise when they see her, she's on TV all the time. So what's this clip where she talks, she's questioned about something very inconsistent coming out of Russia, which is this story of Ukrainian soldiers who were, who were the OSCE negotiated for them to go into the Russian, into, across the border into Russia, get safe passage, not be molested, actually be looked after by the Russians and allowed back into Ukraine. All right, uh, I want to go to Ukraine. Okay. Um, one, I'm wondering if you were... Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry I'm about wondering, that. <laughs> yesterday you said that you weren't able to verify either of these conflicting, the, the many numerous conflicting reports about these I, Ukrainian soldiers. I do have soldiers. a little bit of new yeah. information on do that. Do you have? Yes. Um, the OSCE observer mission on the Russian border facilitated the movement of 437 Ukrainian troops into Russia on August 3rd. Uh, the troops had requested OSCE assistance uh, in opening a humanitarian corridor after being surrounded by separatists and finding themselves without food, fuel, and ammunition. All their attempts to negotiate a ceasefire with the separatists had failed. At least 192 of these uh, servicemen uh, returned to Ukraine on August 4th. Uh, the OSCE was not made aware of any asylum requests. Uh, we also uh, would note that the Russians have committed to return the rest of the troops as well. That's the latest number okay. that we have at this point. I mean, this is, situation seems bizarre. No? I'm, I, I'm just wondering, I mean, so you have a situation where the Ukrainian army that you support is fighting separatists who you oppose but who are supported by Russia. And somehow the OSCE negotiates safe passage for these Ukrainian troops into Russia where they are uh, not molested. They're taken care of, apparently. And then, they, and then some of them go back. This would seem to me to suggest that the situation is made perhaps less uh, recognizing, that there is, recognizing that there is actual shelling and, and fighting going on in certain places. I, what, what does this tell you about the situation between Ukrainian troops and the Russian troops on the other side of the border? Does it tell you anything? Uh, I'm not sure I would venture to do any broad analysis here, given the other events <coughs> that continue to happen on the ground. Um, obviously, in this case, um, the OSCE obviously played a significant role here in assuring their safe passage, and of so certainly we wanted to note that the Russians have agreed to return the troops. Okay, so that's a positive thing? Uh, this particular incident, right. certainly, Do but you, obviously there are a range of other issues that we remain concerned about. Clearly. Uh, I think you yes, you made that uh, very obvious. But you, do you think that it, in the absence, if the OSCE hadn't been there, are you concerned that there might have been, a, that this might have led to... Uh, well, it's, you know, people dying, bloodshed. It's hard to know, Matt, but I mean, it, it was a okay. situation, obviously, where um, they were surrounded by separatists and they had <coughs> no food, fuel, right. ammunition, so it certainly was not a desirable 
situation to be sitting in. Okay, so your position would be then that they should this should never have happened in the first place because there shouldn't be any separatists attacking the. Well, army. certainly the prime the of course primary point right. is that yeah. So the yeah, so Rob, Robbie, that doesn't back up anything about what we're being told, either by the Australian government or the US government, about Russia backing up the separatists at all. Yeah, if, if Russia was behind all this, they're helping out the people that the separatists are trying to kill. Yeah, that's anyway. Weird. This next clip, Craig, is the most important one, though, because this shows the same woman, Saki, admitting that these troops that we're being told are amassing on the border are actually a thousand kilometres away from the border. You, you were asked yesterday about this Russian military aviation military exercise that's going mm -hmm. on. You said you were the U.S. was very deep was was deeply concerned about it that it's provocative. Um, well, the Russian Defense Ministry says that this is this exercise is not taking place really close to the Ukrainian border. It's a thousand kilometers away, uh, and I'm wondering if given, given that if you're you still have deep concerns about this being a provocative exercise. Well, I think, Matt, the point I was making yesterday that I think I would certainly stick with is that obviously the conditions and the circumstances that any of these exercises are taking place in are a relevant factor and that, uh, you know, when we're in a situation where we're trying to reach a ceasefire where the Russians say they want to reach that, these sort of exercises send a different message. Right. But, I mean, it's really not close to the Ukrainian border. So if you're deeply concerned, I mean, how far away can the Russians do military exercises without drawing the concern of the United States? I mean, do they have to be in Vladivostok? I mean, how far, how far away from? I mean, I mean, it, I don't I mean, have an exact uh, kilometer. Uh, uh, Siberia. Where do they? Where? Where? Where exactly is it that the Russians can have military exercises that won't? That you? don't think or that you won't have concerns are provocative to the situation in Ukraine. If there are exercises in Siberia, I'm happy to speak to that at the time. Uh, okay, but you still have con you have concerns about this exercise and it being a pro provocative action, is that correct? Yes. Despite the distance, yes. the rather large distance. Okay. Um, Jen, the Polish foreign minister is very concerned about these exercises and mm -hmm. says that uh, Russia is preparing to invade Ukraine, and, and that has generated a lot of news. The markets are, are way down today. Uh, do you have any comment on that? Well, I think there have been a range of reports and comments out, out there. I think it's there are a few things that we do know. Um, additional Russian forces continue to uh, arrive along the Ukrainian border, uh, and Russia continues to reposition forces throughout the region. Um, we don't have specific numbers from here uh, to to share, um, and diff Troop, you know, specifics on troop numbers is difficult to calculate. So I'm not going to make a prediction from here, but certainly the uh, the um, con the fact that troops continue to arrive is something that we uh, are watching closely and remain concerned and about. So Craig, she no sooner has, does she admit in response to his questioning that these exercises are a thousand kilometers away, then she turns and backs up what the polls are saying that oh, this is this constitutes an invasion of Ukraine. Look, we've got hardly any time, but I, I want to highlight this. The UNHCR, United Nations High Commission on Refugees, the OSCE and the Red Cross have all said this week what is happening on the Russian border, which is that hundreds of thousands of Eastern Ukrainians are flooding across the border into Russia as refugees to get away from the Ukrainian military doing what it's doing. And that's the part that is not coming out in the media at all. It's typical of the dis disinformation of war, Robbie. There's political uh, ambitions here, necessities that people reckon to support the global financial system the way it is today, which is disintegrating, and therefore we're just being fed lies. Yep, so we'll keep following this. Thanks for tuning in. Tune in next week for more.